possibility, I am a promise, with a capital P, I am a great big bundle of potentiality, and I am learning to hear God's voice, and I am trying to make the right choice, I am a promise to be anything God wants me to be. I can go anywhere that he wants me to go. I can be anything that he wants me to be. I can climb the high mountains. I can cross the wide sea. I am a great big promise, you see. I am a promise. I am a possibility. I am a promise with a capital P. I am a great big bundle of potentiality. choice I am a promise to be anything God wants me to be I am a promise to be anything God wants me to be Hello, 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 and good, good evening, everyone. Welcome to the series of God of the Impossible with Pastor Sean Brooks at the Portmore SDA Church. I am your host, Nadine Carr. And for this evening, our program will be Praise and Worship by Lennox and Robert. Opening prayer, Kadeem Reese. And special feature, Pastor Carnell Morgan. Meditation song, Clarice Lewis. And closing and sermon, sorry, by our one and only Pastor Sean Brooks. Bye, everyone. Later. Write my name up there. Write my name. Write my name up there. Touch my finger on the golden pen. The golden pen. The golden pen. Touch my finger on the golden pen. Write my name up there. Write my name. Write my name up there. Write my name. Write my name up there. Touch my finger on the golden pen, golden pen, golden, golden pen. pen. Touch my finger on the golden pen, write my name up there. Write my name, write my name up there. Write my name, write my name up there. Touch my finger on the golden pen, golden pen, golden pen. Touch my finger on the golden pen. Write my name up there. Write my name. You better write my name up there. Write my name. Write my name up there. The Holy Ghost power is moving just like a magnet. The Holy Ghost power is moving just like a magnet. Moving there, moving there. Just like the day of Pentecost, the Holy Ghost power moving just like a magnet. Ooh, the Holy Ghost power is moving just like a magnet. Moving, moving. The Holy Ghost power is moving just like a magnet. Moving, moving. Moving there, moving there. Just like the day of Pentecost, the Holy Ghost power moving just like a magnet. Welcome on all. Welcome, 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 blessed Holy Ghost, we welcome you, come with power and be our temple, Holy Ghost, we welcome you, welcome, welcome, 
welcome, welcome, welcome. Blessed Holy Ghost, we welcome you. Come with power and fill our temple. Holy Ghost, we welcome you. Fire, 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 fire fall on me. Fire, 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 fire fall on me On the day of Pentecost Fire fall on me On the day of Pentecost Fire fall on me Fire, fire, fire Fire fall on me Fire, fire, fire Fire fall on me On the day of Pentecost Fire fall on me on the day, on the day of Pentecost. Fire fall on me. What a mighty God we serve! What a mighty God! What a mighty God we serve! Clap your hands, angels bow before Him. Heaven and earth adore Him. What a mighty God we serve! What a mighty God we serve, a mighty God. What a mighty God we serve. Angel bound before Him, heaven and earth adore Him. What a mighty God we serve. Away, Zion, away, away, God, trim your lamp. Away, Zion, away. Awake and trim your lamp, for the stars of heaven shall fall, and the moon shall turn into blood, and the Son of Man shall appear, Zion awake. Awake, Zion awake, awake and trim your lamp, awake, Zion awake, awake and trim your lamp, for the stars of heaven shall fall, and the moon shall turn into blood. And the Son of Man shall appear, Zion away. My own companion, my own companion, fare thee well. I will not go. I will not go with you to hell. I'm on my way to Canaan. I will not go, I will not go with you. Let us pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we want to thank you for today. Lord, we thank you for the beautiful sunshine. And we thank you for waking us up this morning. Lord, we thank you for food and for our families. Please help those who are poor and those who have no families. Protect them, Lord, and lead them, guide them, so that they will learn more about you. Lord, please give us the strength that we need in our lives so that we will be able to help others, especially those who are experiencing a rough time right now. Thank you for your many blessings. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Well, <laughs> good evening again, everyone, my beautiful friends. Thanks for joining us one more time. We are happy to know you join us and we we celebrate because our god is a good god amazing and wonderful but he just keep blowing our mind with the many blessings he give us 
and tonight he has more blessing for all of you i am going to share the blessing with you but you have to answer my question tonight now last night uh nobody <laughs> get my answer to the question i asked but no problem no problem because you have time to answer so if you can answer last night question you'll still get your gift but you have to watch last night's message and you will hear the question from last night me not telling you <laughs> what the question was um last night but tonight i have another question for you are you ready okay i think you are ready for me here goes <clears throat> ready and the question is how many friends help the paralytic man huh easy right yes i know how many friends help the paralytic man next question for you whose house did the people gather to hear jesus whose house the people gather to hear jesus easy question again yet yeah, i know <laughs> but as we receive all of God's blessing and the gifts I have for you, I want you to share that blessing with others. So don't keep that blessing for yourself. No, share it with others. So, on the screen, you will see the information how you can give your offering and tithe to the Lord to continue the work that the Lord have for us. I thank you for your wonderful and kind gifts that you share and ask that you continue to do the work of the Lord wherever you go. Let us pray a very special prayer at this time for all the offering you will give let us pray our loving lord and our god thank you for this evening and most importantly we thank you for your blessings as you bless us we ask that we will say thank you for all your blessing tonight some of our members and visitors are saying thank you to you for your blessings they show 
their love to you by giving, offering, and tithe. We ask that you bless whatever they give tonight. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you for joining with me for this time and the next voice you'll hear is that of brother Lewis and then we'll hear from the man of God Dr. Pastor Sean Brooks God bless Good night, brothers and sister. This is Brother Lewis. I'm going to sing you a meditation song. I'm crossing life's river, although I can't see the bridge. I know I'll cross over, cause in Jesus I live. I see no one to help me, but I determine to live. I'm crossing life's river, although I can't see the breeze. Thank you, Jesus. I'm crossing life's river, although I can't see the breeze. I know I'll cross over, cause in Jesus I live. I see no one to help me, but I determine to live. I'm crossing life's river, and Jesus Christ is the breeze. Sometimes in your crossing, you sleep along the way, and you thought for a while of giving up. But there's hope in King Jesus, who is the master of us all. He'll guide you through. Although I can't see the bridge, thank you, Lord. I'm crossing life's river, although I can't see the bridge. I know I'll cross over, cause in Jesus I live. I see no one to help me. But I determine to live. I'm crossing life's river, although I can't see the breeze. Thank you, Lord. I'm crossing life's river. Thank you, Jesus. I'm crossing life's river. Although I can't see the bridge, it is the bridge. Thank you, Lord. To God be the glory. We're crossing life's rivers although we can't see the bridge. Thank you, thank you, thank you very much for that beautiful song, Brother Lewis. Uh, you have inspired us and you're helping us to remember that in this life, though we may not understand all that's happening, we can believe that God is in control. Also like to thank all the participants uh, in the program. Pastor Morgan, I see you. 
I, I didn't know you had have so much rhythm. Oh yeah, you, <laughs> a lot of rhythm in that song. So awesome. And the praise song by by Brother Lennox and Brother Roberts that I am enjoying myself. Saints, if you could see me jump up and dance, and I'm just enjoying this singing. I just love it. I love it. Uh, thank you, Brother Kahim Reese, for your prayer uh, in sign language. That was awesome. Thank you for uh, just reaching out to heaven's doors on our behalf. And we believe that God has heard your prayers. And I, you know, what is dear to my heart are the members of the prayer team who continues to are continue to lift up the program night after night. So Sister Moncrief, Sister Beck, Beckford, Sister Eileen, Sister Wellington, thank you for your prayers this evening. Thank you for lifting our hands up. In the Bible, we read about Moses and how he prayed for Joshua as Joshua battled. You see, Joshua may have thought the battle was up to him, but little did he know that really the battle was up on the mountaintop because Moses and Aaron were interceding on their behalf. Saints, more prayer equals more power, and we cannot do this in and of our own might. I want to invite you to share uh, this program on your platform, whether Facebook, YouTube, just share to your friends, share to your family, because I believe something that is said this evening may be a blessing to them and may lead that family member, that friend closer to Jesus Christ. We're going to continue our nightly service up until Thursday. Then on Friday, we take a break and we come back on Sabbath. And guess what? There's something powerful and wonderful that's going to happen on Sabbath. We're going to have a grand baptism, and there are already individuals who have confirmed for the baptism. And if you want to be a part of that number, it is not too late. So at the end of the program, you'll see some numbers going up. You'll see some information. If you want to be a part of that number, uh, please uh, contact us, and we want to make that a reality. This evening, I'll be speaking to you on the topic, making room for those who ask why. Making room for those who ask why. And tomorrow night, tomorrow night, I'll be looking at the topic, how to overcome the giant of depression. You see, because I know that depression is a major factor in uh, our world today. Um, it, depression can hurt so many. Well, come tomorrow evening, and we're going to have a little talk about that and see how one of God's characters was able to overcome depression. Let us pray. Lord, even now we thank you for your goodness and your mercies. And as we open your word, Lord, please speak to our hearts. Renew a right spirit and help us to see you in all your glory in Christ's name. Amen. I know I'm going to work you tonight, Pastor Morgan. <laughs> well, as you see and hear in the messages that have been presented night after night, it is important to make room for those with disabilities. We've seen that. From the worship content or the, the, the liturgy to the building space, the physical uh, worship building. Listen, there are improvements to be made and improvements that must be made by God's grace in order to make room for those with various disabilities. Yet one of the greatest ways that we can make room for those who are differently able disabled, or we can say, or have special needs, is to allow our place of worship to be a safe space. Hear me out. A safe space for the emotional expressions of the heart. I repeat, allowing our space to be a safe place, or worship here to be a safe space for the emotional expressions of the heart. And this is probably the most difficult area for the church to deal with. 
but there are individuals who will come to the church with some burning and pressing questions. Why? Why is it that I'm going through this situation? They may scream at God with the burning question, why? Why, Lord, do I have a disability? Why was my relative the one to get a stroke at this time in their life? Why am I confined to my wheelchair? Why am I the one bullied for something that I cannot change? Why am I overlooked at school, at church, and at the workplace? Why, God, I have some burning questions. Why? I want to share with you that in the darkness of the moment, when you cry out to God, I want you to know that he hears your prayers, he hears your cries, and he is attuned to your grief. Now, if you can turn quickly to the book of Job, the book of Job prior to, just before the book of Psalms, but if you can turn to Job chapter one, we want to look at an individual who had some questions and some valid questions at that. In Job chapter 1, and I won't read through everything, but the Bible talks about a man who lived in the land of Uz, whose name was Job, and, and the Bible says he was blameless and upright, and he feared God and shunned evil. Job was a praying man. Job was a God-fearing man. Job was a consistent man with his walk with the Lord. Job had seven sons and three daughters, and they were all born to him. Also, his possessions were 7,000 sheep, and the, the list goes on because it tells of the wealth this man possessed. Job was such a prayerful man that Job would pray. <laughs> Listen to me now. He would pray for his children if they went and had a party, he would wake up, the Bible says in verse 5, he would wake up in the morning and offer a sacrifice for his children, thinking that maybe they said something that they weren't supposed to say. Maybe they thought something bad. And so let me pray for them and ask that God will be merciful and forgive them. That's the type of person Job was. But Satan was observing this. And the Bible says that in verse 13, there was a gathering. Actually, going to verse 6, there was a gathering where, where at this point in time, Satan still had opportunity of going to heaven to accuse God's people, to accuse the saints. He's nothing but an accuser. And God asked him, have you considered my servant Job. There is none like him. And the devil said, yes, I have. I've, I've come across Job. But God, <laughs> there's a reason why Job serves you. You see, you have allowed Job to connect with his why. Job knows why he is blessed. Job knows why his cattle has increased. Job has connected the dots and he knows that the blessing comes from you. Disconnect him from your why. Disconnect him from the why. And I promise you, God, that Job will curse you to your face. And God said in verse 12, all that he has is in your power. Only do not lay a hand on this person. Do not hurt him. Or better yet, let me just stick to the version. Do not lay a hand because what happened next really hurt Job. The Bible says almost immediately a messenger for Job ran to him and said, Job, there was a tribe there, the Sabians or the Sabians, they came and they attacked 
uh, the, 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 the servants and they killed all the servants who, who were watching the, 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 the oxen and the, the donkeys. And while he was speaking, another servant came and said, Job, something unbelievable occurred. Fire, uh, the fire of God fell from heaven and burned up the sheep and the servants and consumed them. And I alone have escaped, Job. And while that brother was speaking, another came and said, the Chaldeans formed raiding parties and they came and took the camels and killed the servants and while that one was speaking another came and said your sons and daughters and at this point job froze listening what happened to my sons and daughters job there was a a great wind came and the wind came and blew the structure, the corners of the house down. It fell on them, Job. And they are all dead. Your sons and daughters are dead, Job. And I alone have escaped to tell you. At this point in time, Satan came close to Job in the background. Looking at Job because now he was saying, I got you now, Job. I have you now. Now you're weak in the knees. There's no reason now for you to praise God and to worship him. And he observed everything that Job was doing now. But the Bible says that Job fell to the ground after he had shaved his head. And Job did something that blew the devil away. The Bible says that Job worshipped. He worshiped God. That is now a sacrifice of praise. He was worshiping God in spite of his feelings. And he said, naked I came from my mother's womb. Naked shall I return there. The Lord gave and the Lord has taken away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. And in all this, the Bible says, Job did not sin nor charge God with wrong. Satan looked at all this, observed Job, and wanted to hit himself. He wanted to smack himself because he realized that though his children were dead and his investments were gone those were external things those were external connections he should have struck him internally and then job would have cursed god so the bible tells us in chapter 2 and verse 4 that satan answered the lord and said skin for skin Yes, all that a man has, he will give for his life. So he was begging God again, please give me a second chance with Job. And I will prove to you that this man will curse you. He went on, stretch out your hand now. Touch his bone and his flesh. And he will surely curse you to your face. And the Lord said to Satan, Behold, he is in your hand, but spear his life. Do not kill him. Brothers and sisters, hear me out. You are alive today because God has said, Do not kill. Do not hurt him or her. Do not hurt them. That's the only reason why you're alive today. When it is time for you to go to rest, it will happen. But if God does not give permission, it will not happen. God said, spear his life. In a moment, in a moment, Job was beset by a dreadful disease, the likes of which we can only imagine, but maybe, maybe can be compared to, to leprosy or, or cancer in overdrive. His face became unrecognizable. His feet were rendered useless because he could not walk for the boils on his feet. 
There was no position that he could find to gain relief from the boils. It mattered not where he sat or spun. He could not find any relief. He no longer could attend the place of worship. He no longer could go to work. Job was now severely disabled. His wife could not believe amidst everything that her dear husband had to suffer so hard. She looked at him and out of pity and a sense of devastating and heartbreaking loss, she said to him, curse God, Job, and just die already. But in verse 10, Job said to her, You speak as one of the foolish women speaks. Shall we indeed accept good from God? And shall we not accept adversity? In all this, the Bible said, Job did not sin with his lips. Satan stood in the background waiting for Job to curse God, waiting for Job to give up on God, but Job held even tighter to God. I hope somebody is hearing me. Job held even tighter to God, said, I'm not letting you go, God. And the Bible says, in all this, Job did not sin with his lips. Yet Job had some burning questions, questions that needed relief. At this point, Job was not able to go to the house of worship. So his friends, Eliphaz, Bildad, and Zophar came to see him. And these were some spiritual leaders in the land. They were influential leaders. They were philosophical giants who came. These were his friends. These were his, his buddies. And they came to him. And the Bible tells us in verse 12 that when they came and they saw Job, in chapter 2, verse 12, when they saw him, they could not recognize their friend. They couldn't recognize him. And they knew him not, the Bible says. They lifted up their voice and wept. They bawled, as we would say in Jamaica. They bawled and cried and weep over Job. And they rent their mantle, sprinkled dust upon their heads. They were in grief over their best friend. And they sat with him upon the ground. Seven days and seven nights and none spoke a word. They were completely dumbfounded by what they saw. Yet, friends, listen, this was the best thing the friends could have done for Job. This was the best thing that the church, because those friends represent the church, this was the best thing the church could have done for Job. The church members gave Job the gift of presence. Be there for them. Rejoice with them. Mourn with those who mourn, the Bible tells us. You don't need, saints of God, to say anything when tragedy comes upon someone's life or family. That's not the time to tell them about prophecy. That's not the time to tell them that God is good anyway. That's not the time to tell them that, well, it happened to me, so don't worry, you can go. That's not the time. There comes a time for that, but at the point of tragedy, you need to sit down and listen. So they gave Job the best gift at that moment. They gave him the gift of their presence, the gift of love and the gift of their time. I wish, however, that the story ended here. I wish I could close and say these friends were truly friends. But this is where the church now, going forward, fell short. You see, in chapter 3, Job begins to lament. And he's searching his heart. 
and he asks some big questions of God. But his friends interrupted him and challenged him. They were saying to him, you can't ask God why. You can't ask God any questions. Who do you think you are, Job? You see, they could not stand the thought of someone being upset with God, someone speaking frank to God, someone crying out in agony and demanding an answer from God. It bothered them. It provoked their minds. And as you read the book of Job, these friends turned into miserable companions. The flies lingering around his sores were better companions than his friends. I repeat, the flies lingering around his sores were better companions than his friends. Yet in the midst of it all, what the friends did not know, what Job did not know, was that God was listening to every word that was being spoken. Now imagine with me, the unseen guest in that room listening to Job and hear what Job declares amidst his pain. Job does not know God is watching him so close and personal in the moment. But in spite of the pain he was going through, in spite of his challenges, he had this to say. And by the way, saints of God, if you like Job's friends like to judge individuals, please hold off the judgment until you're able to walk in their shoes. In Job chapter 19 and verse 14, starting we get a chance to walk in Job's shoes. And this is what Job says. He says, my relatives have failed and my close friends have forgotten me. Those who dwell in my house and my maidservants count me as a stranger. I am an alien in their sight. I call my servant, but he gives me no answer. I beg him with my mouth to come. My breath is offensive to my wife. And I am repulsive to the children of my own body. Even, Job says, young children, little children despise or hate me. I arise and they speak against me. All, he says, all my close friends abhor me. And those whom I love have turned against me. My bone clings to my skin and to my flesh. And I have escaped by the skin of my teeth. Hear his cry. Have pity. Have pity pity on me have pity on me oh you my friends for the hand of god has struck me and here is question why 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 do you persecute me as god does and are not satisfied with my flesh oh he says oh that my words were written Oh, that they were inscribed in a book, that they were engraved on a rock with an iron pen and lead forever. But I'm here to interrupt you, Job. Yes, they are. Jesus was listening to every word. It was being taken down. God was making note of it, Job. God heard your prayer in the midst of the agony. God heard it and said, I will make sure it is written. And amidst the pain that Job was going through. He says this, for I know, 
that my Redeemer lives and he shall stand at last on the earth and after my skin is destroyed this I know that in my flesh I shall see God. Job's friends were anxious to know what Job may have done to cause God to turn on him. And they echoed what Jesus' disciples were thinking when they walked past a man named Bartimaeus and they asked Jesus, who sinned? Who did it, God? Was it this man, John 9 and verse 2, was it this man? or his parents, that he was born blind. God, we're curious. We want to know. But my brothers and sisters, sometimes we are too fast. We are too curious. We are too into people's business. We need to mind our own business. You see, you finding out how an individual developed a disability will only satisfy your curiosity, but it will not help the person. It won't make life easier for that individual, and it won't remove the disability. So Jesus had to quiet them. Hush with that. Stop that foolishness. Stop being so inquisitive. Stop it and mind your business. Jesus said to them, listen, Verse 3, this neither, neither this man nor his parents sinned, get it into your head, but that the works of God should be revealed in him. I, Jesus says, must work the works of him who sent me while it is day. I came to serve individuals like Bartimaeus. I came to work while in the day to ensure that Bartimaeus can be the potential that I have for him or to reach the potential I have for him. So long as I'm in the world, he says, I am the light of the world. So saints of God, stop judging. Stop harassing folks. Stop meddling in people's business. Instead of asking how comes you have this or how comes this is wrong with you, we must ask the question, how can I serve you like Jesus has served us? Going back to Job, we find that God decided to speak up. In chapter 38, the Bible says in verse 1, Then the Lord answered Job, Out of the whirlwind. Now pause there. Could it be that amidst everything that Job was going through, the devil was now bringing about a physical storm in Job's life? You think it can't get any worse, but now there's a literal storm outside. But the Bible says that while Job was in the storm, God spoke out of the whirlwind. God spoke through the storm. God spoke in the darkness of the night and said, Job, I'm here. Job, I'm listening. Job, I'm by your side. I have never left your side. Even in the darkest hour of the night, I have been there with you. God said to him in verse 3, now prepare yourself, Job, like a man. I want to question you, and you shall answer me. And, and God uh, asks Job about nature. He asks God, he asks, he asks Job about creation. He asks Job about the cosmos, of which Job could not answer. Job could not give an answer. And, and Job realized that, that the mind of God is higher than his. His thoughts are much higher than his. His ways are much higher. But it was okay with Job. Job was just happy that God was speaking to him. Job was just happy to hear the voice of God. But catch this. In chapter 42, after God was through talking to Job, God turned to Eliphaz and his two friends and said to them, you, all of you, you offended me. 
You offended me because what you spoke about me was not right. You offended me because you placed me in a wrong light. You offended me because you made me seem cruel and vindictive against Job. You have offended me this day. And I want you, he said, to go to Job. And Job is going to pray for you. I will not accept your prayers until you go to Job and ask for forgiveness. Until you go to Job. And Job is the one who must pray for you because you have offended him. So often we have offended people. We have stigmatized people. We have put them down. We have made sure or ensured that they're not able to come into our worship place, our worship of, and place of fellowship. And God says, you have offended me. You may need to apologize in order for me to hear your prayers. You see, saints, God was not upset with Job for asking him tough questions. Listen now, God was not upset with Job for asking him tough questions. God was upset with his friends for interrupting him. I repeat, God was not upset with Job for asking him tough questions. God was upset with his friends for interrupting Job. God was listening to Job. God was patiently hearing the complaints of Job and that was okay with God. But his friends came in and interrupted the conversation, interrupted Job's prayer interrupted that flow from Job. You see, we don't like when people are speaking their minds. We don't like it when they're speaking of their hurt and their pain. We want to tell them to be quiet. Shh, don't talk like that. You may offend God. But we misrepresent the character of God when we shut people up. For God is the one who says in Matthew 11 and verse 28 to 29, Come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden. Not some. He said, all ye that labor and are heavy laden. And I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn of me, for I am meek and lowly in heart, and you shall find rest for your souls. So God was saying, I can handle a screaming child if a child has lost his or her parents and they're crying out to God. God says, I can handle the cries. I am big enough to hear their cries, for I am meek if a grieving parent comes and is agonizing to God because of a loss of a child or some difficulty that their child has to go through. God is saying, I am gentle enough to hear their requests. I am gentle enough to hear their broken heart. No matter the pain, come to me because I am love. When they come, God says they can share their grief and they can ask their why. And in exchange, I will give them rest. Not you. I will give them rest. I can give them peace. I can give them hope. Now notice, when you read the book of Job, you will not find a place in any of those chapters where God tells Job why. Why he allowed Satan to do all of this. Why he lost his children. Why he lost his, 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 his family and his investment. God did not share with Job the why. You see, there will come a time for that. A time is coming for that. But in the meantime, God desires us to trust him that he is at work in our lives and he will work for our best interest. So he says, trust in me with all your heart. Lead not to your own understanding. In all your ways, acknowledge me. 
and I shall direct your path. But I'm getting to the good part now. I'm just about to wrap up, but here's the good part. You see, for Job and every person who asks why, a time is coming, such as is found in 1 Corinthians 15 and 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, that declares that God shall resurrect us in the newness of life. A time will come when this mortal shall put on immortality. Now, if you've been to a funeral, and I know you've been to several, guess what? You've always heard those passages and reference to God coming and just transforming us in a moment. Hear me out now. That is an easy thing for God to do. We're talking about the God of the impossible. That's a light thing for God to do, to, to speak a word that, 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 that the deaf will be able to hear. The blind can see just by the spoken word of God. God is able to put bones together. He's able to put muscles and sinews together. He's able to put our skin together in a moment. That is easy for God to do. But you see, Answering the question, why, requires time. And this is why very quickly, when you turn to Revelation 20 and verse 4, the Bible says that we're going to be doing something in heaven. The Bible says, I saw thrones, and they, that's you and me, they sat upon them, and judgment was given unto them. And I saw the souls of them that were beheaded for the witness of Jesus and for the word of God and which had not worshipped the beast, neither his image, neither had received his mark upon their foreheads or in their hands. And they lived and reigned with Christ a thousand years for a thousand years. We will reign with Jesus. We will be judges in heaven. Even according to first Corinthians chapter six and verse three, Paul says, know you not that you shall judge angels. We shall judge angels. How much more things that pertain to this life. So for a thousand years, the judgment, we will be able to see the books. We will be able to look and see how God reigned during our time here on earth. And we will see how God operated. Questions that we have had will be answered. You see, you ask the question, why do we need a thousand years? You see, Jesus can resurrect the dead in a moment, but it may take a thousand years to answer the questions. So Job, Job will come and examine the records because Job's questions were not answered. Hear me out. And Job will take a look at the records and will see the conversation that Satan had with God. He will see his sufferings in the light of the plan of salvation. And his jaw will drop when he realizes that because of his disability, millions, if not billions of lives were strengthened on account of his story. People like you and me will come to Job and say, Job, thank you. Thank you, Job. Thank you for holding on. Thank you for trusting God. Thank you for declaring your faithfulness to God in spite of your pain. You helped me, Job. When I was going through my troubles, Job, I looked at your story and your story comforted me, Job. Thank you, Job. Blind Bartimaeus will come and will look with his eyes. For every eye shall behold him, and he will look with his eyes upon that book and will re remember the questions that he had on earth. Why, Jesus, was I born blind? And he will look and see that a host of people that no man will number all of a sudden will gather around him and will say, Bartimaeus, what? Bartimaeus, we know you. How do you know me? 
We remember reading your story. We thank God that you held on to God. We thank God that you called out to him, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. We were inspired by that. And when Jesus opened your eyes, you held on to the faith of Jesus, even though the Pharisees and scribes booted you out of the temple. You held on to Jesus. I am here because of you, Bartimaeus. But saints, you too will have an opportunity to look at your life, your ups and your downs, the trials that made you cry. And you're going to have your wives as well. And you're going to remember those times where you screamed out, God, where were you? Why did you let this happen to my family? Why, God? But my brothers and sisters, people will come to you. Friends whom you've never met will come to you in heaven and say, thank you for your testimony. Thank you for your faith. Thank you for not giving up because it's because of you why I was convicted by the Holy Ghost to accept Jesus. I saw your patience. I saw your strength and I wanted to be like you. And then, then in heaven, we will realize that we are not worthy of wearing a crown. We will realize the goodness of God in our lives even when we felt that God had abandoned us. And we will take off our crowns and cast them at the feet of Christ. And we will say, you, not me, you are worthy, God. You are worthy, our Lord and God, to receive glory and honor and power. For you created all things, and by your will they were created and have their being. And God will be able to answer our deepest questions. And God, God himself, shall wipe every tear, every tear, every tear from their eyes. When Rwanda was going through that internal conflict and genocide, there were some ladies that fled to Tanzania and they were staying at a refugee camp. And while there, the psychologists recognized that the ladies were not sleeping. They had seen many things. Many of them were brutally victimized and raped and they could not sleep. Their hearts were burning. They were in grief with what they saw and witnessed. So one psychologist decided to go out and set up a tent outside of the camp and invited the ladies to come and to share their stories. Just come, I will sit and I will listen. I will not say anything. I will just listen to you. Come and share your stories. And one by one, the ladies came and they sat and they poured out the pain. They poured out the agony. They poured out their distress, the loss of family members, the loss of friends, the brutality they witnessed, the things they saw. And it is said that after just a few weeks, of them coming and finding the space to share their story without any condemnation, all the ladies began to sleep at night. There are some restless souls out there who simply need a space for them to share the grief and agony 
that is upon their heart. They can find it by God's grace at our places of worship. They can find it by God's grace at our homes. But I'm here to tell you that they can find it in Jesus Christ. Because Jesus says, I am a sweet and sympathizing Savior. I will listen to you. You can pour out your burden upon me. You can talk to me all through the night. I will not interrupt you. You can scream at me. You can ask me why. I will not condemn you. Come, Jesus says, pour out your heart to me. And I will hear you. And I will strengthen you. And I will give you rest for your burdened soul. This evening, if it is your desire to have sweet rest in Jesus, I invite you to come and simply submit to the King of Kings. Simply ask the Lord of heaven to take control of your vessel. You can say with me, have thine own way, Lord. You can even type it in the chat. Have thine own way, Lord. Have thine own way with me. I don't know why these things are happening to me, but I will trust you with all my heart. Like Job, you can say, I know that my Redeemer lives. I don't have all the answers, but one thing I do know, He lives. And if He lives, I can face tomorrow. If you have made that decision to say, Jesus, have thine own way with me, I'm going to pray with you. If you've not yet submitted your life and are preparing yourself for baptism, which is just a public display of what Jesus has already done privately in your heart. If you have not prepared yourself, then the opportunity is there for you to call the numbers or in the chat, just say, please contact me. And we will do our best to contact you. Because once you say that, once you write that, the Holy Ghost will be upon you. The Holy Ghost will be ensuring that somebody contacts you. I'm going to pray for you right now. And I'm going to pray for the heart that is burdened. That God, I see, I see you, Sister Thomas. That God, that God will do something powerful in your life, that tonight, if it's the first night in the week, that you can rest and have a good night's sleep, I'm going to pray that God's will be done for you. Let us pray. Lord, we thank you for your goodness and your mercies. We thank you, Jesus, for your grace. Oh God, we we are examining scripture and we now can just see a glimpse of your love. You love us with an everlasting love. And oh God, even though there are times we ask and scream at you, why? In your divine providence, God, you know that is impossible to explain the plan of salvation in just a few short moments, in a few short days. There will come a time, a millennium, 1,000 years, where you'll be able to explain to us why you did some of the things you did. God, until then, give us patience. Give us hope. Like Job, help us to hold on to you in the darkest hour in our lives and in our experiences. Help us to hold on to you because you're a good God, you're a faithful God, and you love us with an everlasting love. Oh Lord, I pray for those who are submitting their lives to you right now. God, I this thing is serious. 
If they are asking that you can have your way in their life, this is being recorded by the angels surrounding them. The Holy Spirit has registered that decision. And oh God, there is celebration going on right now. And so as you've placed this conviction upon their hearts, Lord, place the conviction upon the workers right now to ensure that we make contact with them. Place the conviction upon the pastors around the region to ensure that we work with these souls so that one day soon we can publicly celebrate their decision made in private in a time of baptism so that the world can celebrate as well. So God, we thank you for hearing and answering our prayers. We thank you for the hope as found in you. And I pray, God, that someone who has been burdened with guilt, somebody who has been traumatized in life, will find sweet peace in your presence. And that tonight, God, they can go to bed knowing that Jesus has forgiven them, knowing that salvation has come to their home, knowing that whatever they've gone through, one day you will wipe away their tears, Give them sweet rest this evening. We pray in the mighty name of Jesus. Amen and amen. Saints of God, I hope to see you tomorrow evening. Please share this with someone else. And tomorrow we'll come back and look at the topic, how to overcome depression. May God bless you and keep you always. Amen, amen, amen. I cannot stop saying that word. That word is very, very powerful. And thank you, Pastor. Thank you so much for giving us that these words of encouragement. For me personally, I am happy. I am good. So brothers and sisters, join us tomorrow for another word from past the book. See you, good night, bye. I am a promise, I am a possibility, I am a promise with a capital P. I am a great big bundle of potentiality and I am learning to hear God's voice and I am trying to make the right choice I am a promise to be anything God wants me to be I can go anywhere that he wants me to go I can be anything that he wants me to be. I can climb the high mountains. I can cross the wide sea. I am a great big promise, you see. I am a promise. I am a possibility. I am a promise with a capital P. I am a great big bundle of potentiality. made the right choice. I am a promise to be anything God wants me to be. I am a promise to be anything God wants me to be.